Hello, welcome to X-Ray. I'm Neil Wilson. I'm the Chief Market Analyst here at Markets.com. And today I have the great pleasure uh, to be joined by Mark Spiegel from Stanfield Capital. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Neil. The, the pleasure is all, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to get straight into it um, with Tesla. Um, you are perhaps one of the longest bears on Tesla, I think, since Unfortunately. 2014. <laughs> Uh, it's been a it's definitely been a pain trade especially last year um and yesterday i saw you know there's been a lot happening with tesla recently um and yesterday i saw elon musk tweeting that he thinks that um the full self-driving beta 9.2 is not that great in his opinion um so i just wanted to see what you made of the recent kind of goings on and and maybe explain a bit about your your short thesis on, on tesla a bit more you mean the product that he's been selling uh for five years now and charging anywhere from $7,000 to $10,000 for is not that great. However, I do notice that he's still selling it and still putting it out there on public roads. Um, sure, sure, okay. Um, look, big picture, I first got short Tesla in size in uh, 2014, believe it or not. And for all the reasons that I remain short now and for everything that's happening now, which is that I knew that once electric cars became mandated by every government and you know became necessary to build that all of the large auto manufacturers would swarm in with terrific electric cars as they are doing you know right now and you know tesla would just be another car company only it would be another car company that wouldn't be able to subsidize its its lack of profitability on electric cars with very profitable uh, you know gasoline and diesel you know cars and suvs so what I absolutely did not anticipate was, was that it would be able to operate in such an entirely fact-free zone. And you know, today, as I speak to you, have a $700 billion market cap. I mean, to put that in perspective, that's around um, five times the market cap of VW Group, which by some time next year on a run rate basis, we'll be building as many EVs and selling as Tesla, if not more. And then on top of that, we'll be building and selling another nine or 10 million extremely profitable cars, including you know, Porsche, Audi, and, and of course, all the other brands they own, not, not least of which is Volkswagen. So, and, and yet, you know, so basically, you know, right now, Tesla sells one twelfth the cars of VW and and has, you know, call it five times the valuation. So you're basically paying, you know, 35 times as much for every Tesla sold as for every VW group car. So, I mean, it's just completely absurd. And then, so that's the main reason I've been short Tesla. Um, as the years developed, the, the you know, continual lying uh, nature of Elon Musk, you know, beyond just exaggeration, because when you look at when you look at his depositions through all the times he's been sued now, you can see it was outright lying in many cases. Um, that just added to the reasons why I'd want to be short this thing, because that's basically just another box that gets checked for a short position. Oh, you know, securities fraud committing CEO. Great. That's perfect. That's that's another resort. However, the other thing I didn't anticipate was that at least up until very recently, he would get essentially complete regulatory immunity from every agency in America. And, you know, this is, nobody's ever seen this before. I mean, you know, he basically got, he got away with, with, with tweeting a, a false buyout, of course, everybody knows the, the 420 thing and got basically a wrist slap, a $20 million fine. And he, get to, and he got to put his stooge in as chairman, that woman who just is, is an ignoramus, which you can see from the, the Solar City testimony from a few weeks ago, and, you know, is very happily, you know, well-paid and just does whatever he tells her to. So the two things I didn't anticipate were the complete decouple. I mean, even today, Tesla's up $1.50 the day after Musk said that his full self-driving doesn't work very well, right? I mean, if this were a normal stock for which presumably hundreds of billions of dollars of value is predicated on what we've always known as nonsensical, it's, it's full self-driving capability, Stock will be down 20, 30% today on, you know, 20 or 30% today on that. And, you know, here it is as we're speaking, it's up a, a buck 70. So I, I absolutely just could not believe that the, the complete disconnect of this stock from reality. Let me put it that way. 
Okay, so how um, how would you suggest um, you know navigating this maybe for traders going forward? Is is the did you see anything in the Q two results that, that told you something new, something maybe to rethink, or are you still absolutely fully in so, on the short position? So even in the Q two results, um, ostensibly they made a little over a billion dollars. I think around a billion one. Over three hundred million dollars uh, of that were these emission credit sales. That's a revenue stream that goes away for them at some point next year when all the other automakers have enough electric cars of their own that they don't have to buy them from Tesla. Uh, another 300 million, is, which is my estimation, and a long explanation would be a bit probably too in the weeds for this conversation, but I put out a detailed thread on it on Twitter a few weeks ago. My, my Twitter handle, by the way, is, is at uh, Stanfill Cap. That's S T A N P H Y L uh, cap. But you know, I and a number of people believe they they grossly under reserve uh, their warranty every quarter for future warranty liabilities. And I think that's about another three hundred million dollars. So if you put those two things together, they probably made you know somewhat legitimately around fifty cents a share. So annualized, that's two dollars. The auto industry sells at 12 times earnings. You know, Tesla's growing a little bit faster. I, I urge people not to use those year over year comps, which are silly because they had just opened the Chinese factory and saved a massive tariff by selling in China. I would advise them to look at same territory sales growth, which is a trickle at this point. I would, I would advise them to look at sequential sales growth. For instance, from Q2 to Q3, they sold a total of 16,000 more cars. That's a rounding error for a large auto OEM. Ford sells 16,000 F-150 pickup trucks just here in America in you know, less than a week, right? So um, this, is, this is my long winded way of saying, you wanna put a growth multiple on Tesla and the industry is 12 times, you know, put a 20X multiple on it. That's very generous considering you know, how much we've seen Musk lie, we don't really know how good those financials are. I mean, you know, if, if he's lying about things that we can easily discern publicly, what's going on behind the scenes? I mean, you, you think that's all, but whatever, 20 times $2 would make it a $40 stock, right? It's now $707, right? So I, I, what is that? You know, there's, there's, there's probably 95% downside or something in this stock before it gets a very generous valuation. So Yes, I'm staying short. Uh, my advice for anybody else, I will not get, you don't want my advice on Tesla, okay? You're talking to a guy who's been short this since 2014. It's only through some modicum of risk management that I'm still in business, you know, and that, that I've lost money on it, but I haven't lost that much money on it. I mean, my performance has been lousy the last four years, even though I've had a lot of winners, because if you have a large short position that in one year, you know, goes up seven or eight X on you, you, you know, I mean, these, this is not a 2% position for me. This is a position I've had a significant portion of the fund in because it's been, you know, so obvious, albeit wrongly obvious in terms of the stock price. So the, the best advice I can give anybody is if you ever short a stock, two things, number one, size it small enough that you don't lose two minutes of sleep over it. Okay. If you have to get up at, well, I don't know, you know, your hours, but here, for instance, in, in New York, the pre-market opens at 4 a.m. And, and it closes at 8 p.m. You know, if you have to keep your eye on the screen until 8 p.m. or get up at 4 a.m. because you're worried about what's going on with your short position, any short position, it's too big for you. And number two, you know, use stops. I, I, I never use stops on a fundamental long position, which, by the way, I separate that from, I'm long um, precious metals now, gold and silver, um, for, for the obvious reasons that you know, all the money printing, et cetera. But they also trade a lot on emotion. And I will use stops if, if, you know, if they dive down under what looks to me like a decent support point. I don't do that on, on I'm, a, I'm a value investor. I don't do that on fundamental long positions. If nothing changes with the company, I'll buy more if it goes down. That is not the way to handle a, stock, a, a short position. Um, when, when you've got something such as Tesla, which is completely decoupled from reality, um, you know, as David Einhorn actually has said in the past, you know, once it's, you know, 300 times earnings, it could go to 3000 times earnings. It doesn't make any difference. It's play money at that point. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him. So use, use 
keep the position small enough that it, that you don't lose sleep over it and make sure you use you know use stops or if you want to buy puts buy puts and, and that limits your risk i mean it's hard it's been impossible to time this thing with puts a lot of guys have tried it so those are my two pieces of advice i will not give any specific advice about where to short tesla or whatever i'll just tell you that i'm still short it but i use stocks and if it takes out a stop i might try again higher you know Thank you for that, Mark. Um, let's move on, segue a little bit into um, ARC and Kathy Wood and ARC K. Obviously, it's a, uh, it has a 10% of that is Tesla. Um, and you are also short that particular ETF. I saw uh, Michael Burry, Sion Capital. He recently joined the party, as you said, as he tweeted, I think, welcome to the party, you said. Um, so, you know, is that, you know, your, your, your view on that? Obviously, Tesla plays into that partly. Um, but is it just on valuations um, or is it more of a kind of concern that, they're, that the ARC and their analysts, you know, their secret weapons are maybe misreading the uh, structural growth um, kind of outlook for, for a lot of these stocks? Well, actually, you know, for a, for a sort of a, funda a very good fundamental analysis of ARC, there's a guy on Twitter and he, they had him on CNBC uh, one day last week. Um, maybe you saw the thread, Michael Bloom, Bloom, was it Michael, something Bloomquist or something? Did you see this thread? He, he, yeah. he took it down piece by piece about, about how much these companies would have to grow to meet the, the expectations priced in. I just look at ARC as a, as sort of the poster child for this bubble market. And it's just the easiest for me, sort of one-stop shorting for, uh, last I looked, 49 bubble stocks. And rather than getting involved with each one and, and you know, putting on a whatever, a one or 2% position on each one, I just put on a large arc position. And Kathy Wood is a joke. Um, I, you know, I used to think she was, she was just sloppy in her work. I think it's much more uh, malevolent than that because you know, she's put out these models before, specifically on Tesla at least, that actually had a number of factual errors in them and her factual errors were corrected by people on Twitter. And it's obvious that she saw them because she was tagged in the tweets, as were her analysts. And rather than acknowledging that she made a mistake, she would just uh, have her analyst or her analyst would just, you know, change whatever multiple was in there uh, in order to keep the same target price, right? Of whatever it is now, $3,000 or something. I mean, that's, that's just dishonest. So, um, you know, I, I'm short arc. It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's just, it's just, it's a poster child, but the same situation. I mean, I use stops. Um, you know, I'll, if it takes out a stop, I have to take some off. I take some off. I, you know, I'll put it back on again, maybe at a higher price or maybe at a lower price. So, but yes, but that's the reason it's just, it's just a collection of bubble stocks. I mean, look, I'm sure there's a couple of good companies in there, but there's just so much nonsense in there. Do you think we're in a bubble? Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, by any, by any objective metric, uh, we're in a massive bubble. Um, you know, at least I, I don't want to talk about uh, UK stocks because you might have some much better buys there, actually. I've read that you have. I just, I don't do anything overseas. But clearly, you know, here in the US in terms of price to sales, you know, price to EBITDA, I mean, the, the fact that that inflation here is running at five or 6% a year and the you know, the 10 year bond is now yielding less than 1.3% as I look at it. I mean, that's a joke. And look, we've all heard, you know, these Fed clowns are like, oh, it's transitory. It's transitory. Let's say it's transitory. Before COVID hit, we had like almost a full year of 2.3% core CPI inflation. Okay. That was before COVID. So even if you were going to say, well, most of this is transitory and the light out the supply chains and it's going to go from whatever, five or six percent back down to two and three quarters percent. Well, you know, you have a 10 year bond, which is yielding like 130 basis points or 140 basis points better than the best case inflation scenario. I mean, it's absurd. Everything's everything is above. You know, there's a guy I talked about this recently in another interview. There's a very smart former energy hedge fund uh, guy uh, out of Texas named John Arnold, and now he just runs a charitable foundation. He, he basically got out at the top, which is pretty rare for an energy uh, oil and gas trader, and he was smart enough to do it. Anyway, back in March, 
he said something on Twitter, and I'm paraphrasing here, this wasn't the exact quote, but it was something like, central banks have printed so much money that people have had to invent entirely new categories to shovel it into. And he specifically mentioned cryptocurrencies, what is it, NF, NFPs, NFTs, whatever NFTs. the hell they're called, sneaker collections. I mean, he put through this whole list. It's The whole thing is absurd. These, these Fed people just never learn. They never realize that they're trying to fix the last bubble with an even bigger, bigger bubble. And, you know, what's going to blow this one up? Well, what's going to blow this one up is when people realize that or, or, or come to accept that inflation is real. OK, right now, um, you know, the market is very sanguine about inflation. I mean, inflation break evens have a two handle, which, as I said, even with a two handle, a 10 year you know, bond that's yielding 1.3 is completely absurd, but whatever. So if they start thinking, oh, wait a second, you know, there's going to be a four handle or a five handle here, stocks will implode. I mean, you will just get massive PE ratio compression the same way you got it in the first half of the 1970s, which as I, I think that's where we're going in this stagflationary environment is we have this very big spending government, um, which is you know, going to be this, this tailwind for inflation. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's what I think is going to happen. And people say, oh, well, rates won't go up because you know, uh, the US government can't afford to raise rates because it has too much debt. Well, guess what? Whatever the U.S., whatever the Fed does, you know, and it could it could sort of, um, you know, repress, you know, that you know rates for a very long time and probably get away with it. That's not what's going to happen in the real world. In the real world, if you've got five or six percent inflation, nobody's going to pay fifty times earnings for a stock anymore. They're not going to say, oh, well, the Fed kept interest rates at one percent. No, you'll find other places for the money. You know, you'll do private sector lending at seven percent a year. Maybe you'll buy a, you know, a real estate. Uh, a company, you know, that can raise rent every year, you know, you'll go into gold and silver, which is which is my bet, actually. So whatever the Fed does, that's I don't that's not going to that's not going to put it that's not going to keep elevated these absurd PE ratios on stocks, they're going to react, you know, to real world inflation, which I think is coming, which it's here, right? you know, this question is how long it stays. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I read your note from the beginning of November, talk, the October note, talking about the the inflation stimulus chasm, um, warning about stagflation being the the kind of the the road that we're going down. And it seems that the, the latest reports do seem to be, you know, indicating that growth is growth is proving a lot less sticky than the inflation is right now. Um, so I wonder. I don't know if you've got just to keep it kind of into this week. Um, what do you think of Jackson Hole? Is there anything that we need to look at, look out for there, or do you think it's just going to be the usual kind of, you know, I don't talking? Know. I know you're, you know, any your guess is as good as mine. I just saw a report this morning. I guess Goldman is saying that that they expect a taper to be announced in November. I mean, Jerome Powell used to be a smart guy. I don't know what the hell happened to him. And and honestly, I don't know why he wants to keep the job. I mean, is he so stupid that he doesn't realize, you know? what he's created here and how hard it is actually impossible. It will be to maneuver out of it. Right. But you know, whatever, um, I don't know what he's going to say. I mean, I'll tell you this. I, I am not a, I am not one of these lifetime gold bugs or silver bugs. I never owned uh, precious metals in my life until some point last year. I think I started buying them maybe last summer or last fall. I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's in my fun letters, all documented. Because the only thing I feel good owning when, when he opens his mouth is gold. <laughs> I mean, even silver, which I have less of than gold, I don't feel quite as good because obviously that's somewhat leveraged to, to you know, economic demand, right? So if we do get a stagflationary environment, it's possible that you know, industrial use for silver might might decline and, and you know, put some kind of limit on its price, but I, I don't know, but I own it, you know. But again, all this stuff with stocks, but that's the only thing I feel good owning at this point when, when those guys talk. It's just, it's terrible. And not just him, the rest of the, rest of the Fed too, with small exceptions. Even the guys now who are, you know, allegedly more hawkish on the Fed, right? Oh, we should start tapering immediately, right? They still want to keep printing tens of billions a month for months and months and months. And, and I guarantee you, the day the S&P 500 
you know, is down five or 10%, that'll be the end of that. That'll be the end of the taper, right? So I, my theory has been that like the last bubble will be precious metals, right? It just hasn't happened yet. I mean, yeah, over the years, they're sort of up a little depending on your time frame. They're up, you know, very nicely if you go back from 20 years ago, but certainly in recent years, they've sort of bounced around in this range and, and done very little. Um, you know, at some point, people are going to be like, oh, I got to buy gold, I got to buy. So they're going to pour into it. It'll be another big bubble and that'll get overvalued, you know, and I'll sell it. <laughs> so, you know, for once, for what, you know, as a value investor, I never get to be long bubbles. I only, I only, you know, either completely avoid them or short the ones that are most obvious. And sometimes that's very painful as in Tesla. For once, I'd like to be long a bubble. So I'm looking to, I'm looking to be long gold and silver when they become a bubble. <laughs> Awesome. Well, th thank you, uh, Mark. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us here on x-ray at markets.com.